Smith at all? Yes.
Okay, can everybody hear me? We are going to get started. Thank you for coming to our CLIMB seminar. Uh, we're very happy and lucky today to have Misha Belkin visiting us. Uh, Misha is a professor at the Halidjolu Data Science Institute. If somebody is Turkish in the audience, you can tell me how to pronounce that afterwards. Um, Misha is a very interesting guy. He's, he's very well known for some of his earlier work on, uh, on graph-based machine learning and has done some very interesting work there uh, out of his PhD and then for many years. And then more recently he's been doing um, some very influential work on over-parameterized machine learning, including what I think is coining the term double descent that we all uh, now use fondly. And today he is going to talk to us about towards a practical theory of deep learning and then he'll read you the subtitle. So please take it away, Misha. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, very nice to be here. It's, um, yeah, and uh, I apologize for the length uh, of the title. It's, um, I want to say it was necessary, but maybe it wasn't. <laughs> uh, so I, I kind of would like to have, um, in a sense, this talk, um, I'll start with, um, in some sense, maybe a little bit of a more philosophical part of the talk. And um, I wrote, actually, recently some thoughts about why do we need deep learning theory and w what, what that theory might look like. And so I, I would like to just maybe say like a few words in the beginning about like what is so surprising about what we have seen in deep learning recently and why it is such a... Um, has been a revelation to, to, to so many of us. And um, then I would like to, uh, then I will discuss uh, how we can maybe think about building such a theory of deep learning and, and something more specific and in particular how to incorporate certain ideas that we sort of understood through deep learning into methods that um, maybe are a little bit more analyzable and that we can hope to understand. Uh, and this is uh, joint work. So most of what I'm going to talk about is joint work with um, Daniel Bigelhall, Adit Radhakrishnan, and Party Pandit, who did um, excellent work here. It's been a real pleasure to collaborate with them. Um, okay, so let, let me maybe start from the beginning, uh, from from this kind of slide, and. You, you know, like that, you know, we all played with GPT-4 and so on, so there is nothing really new here. But this was, at least for me, this was kind of like um, a little bit of eye-opening. When um, a, a few months ago, this GPT code interpreter came out. Now it's called advanced data analysis. And you can do pretty amazing stuff within the thing. So, for example, you can say, like, uh, you can upload some data and you can say, fit a kernel support vector machine to my train data so that the accuracy is perfect on train report test accuracy, right? As you can see, these are very kind of vaguely defined things. And, you're, you know, if you ask, for example, like, you know, somebody who is not really like an expert in machine learning to do that, they will probably struggle. Like, how do you actually choose parameters so the fit is perfect? Uh, so, uh, the answer was pretty much perfect. It says like, okay, let's try increasing the C parameter to a large value, which is what you need to uh, fit it perfectly. And it produces a code, it runs a code, it gives accuracy, it like discusses this whole thing. So this is like, this is, to me, this was very much eye-opening. This is amazing. Um, and, well, we have now seen that this, this systems are doing the stuff which is clearly is intelligent. Like, you know, they pass various exams, they speak multiple languages, they do, you know, like Google interview question, they're uh, endlessly enthusiastic to borrow the term, uh, basically like, better than average undergraduate student in any kind of topic. Um, now, is it surprising? And, uh, and the answer is uh, yes, but uh, let, let's see what is surprising here. And I think in principle, the mainstream belief has long been that artificial intelligence was possible. So that is perhaps maybe surprising, but maybe not so surprising, because I, I don't think that too many people would say that it's completely impossible. Um, maybe some would, but um, it certainly was not uh, such a marginal position. 
So that maybe is not that surprising. I think what is really surprising is the nature of the model which does all of the things. And the nature of the model here is actually just a simple statistical Markov model. And it's trained on limited data. It's a relatively small model. It's trained on relatively limited data. And it's an extremely simple model. And now, of course, when I say this, you know, what I mean? It's like trained on a trillion data points. But let me describe exactly what I mean by a limited model. I think it's surprisingly small for what it does. It's surprisingly, the data amount is surprisingly small, and the model size is surprisingly small. Uh, so so let, let me just review this. Uh, Again, this is probably familiar, but uh, so what are what what LLMs? This is simply Markov models. And Markov models, so you have this quantity, uh, whatever you call it, high, high order Markov chain. Um, so you have these words, and they're called tokens, so uh, you can just think of them as words. Um, and if you have a context window of 4,000, which is, I think, close to what it is in, G uh, I think, GPT 3.5 or something like that is about 4,000 uh, con size context window. So you sample from, so it constructs a probability distribution of the word 4,001 given this 4,000 words. It samples from this probability distribution and then it simply adds this and shifts the context window by one. And it just keeps doing this. That's all there is to it. So it's an extremely uh, simple Markov chain. Well, simple in the sense that it's a simple process, of course. The, the model itself is complex. Um, and the amazing thing here is that it does it just one token at a time. There is no reason to plan for the future, right? We think, okay, maybe it plans. You, you, you can imagine you like generate a bunch of potential completions and then do some sort of uh, beam search or do some other thing. But no, it's just one at a time. That's it. So one talking at a time, no internal memory states, and it's simply trying to predict the next talking, right? It's, uh, uh, so, okay. Now, uh, maybe I'll just to, to take a step back and just to go kind of uh, a little bit look at history. So Chomsky famously said that um, probability of a sentence is an entirely meaningless term. Uh, that was in 69, and okay, this is a very extreme maybe point of view, and uh, maybe now even Chomsky doesn't really believe this. But um, I think what is much more reasonable point of view was uh, sort of Peter Norwich's much later response to Chomsky. This is from 2011. He said Markov model of word probabilities cannot model all of language. What is needed is a probabilistic model that covers word syntax, uh, semantics, context, discourse, and so on. Well, guess what? None of the things are built in. So whatever is in LLMs, it's just one word at a time. It's just a Markov model. So, uh, and, you know, and I would say this is probably a very mainstream position from about 10 years ago. I would personally certainly agree with this. Um, now, of course, uh, now uh, 12 years later, uh, Peter Norvig says that uh, artificial general intelligence already is here. So he, he, he changed his mind, and I think many of us have as well. Uh, but um, so this is, I think, uh, a pretty surprising and sort of completely unexpected for, again, I don't want to speak for everyone, but certainly for me, completely unexpected a turn of events. And uh, you know, there is this kind of old uh, uh, trope that uh, building a statistical model to, long, to, to model language to, to, you, know, you know, to build AI is like climbing a tree to reach the moon. So, you know, this is the answer from artificial intelligence to that. Uh, so if you give a, a prompt to DALI 3, that's pretty good, right? Uh, we climbed, right? And we, we reached the moon. So what does it tell us about the moon? or trees, or climbing, I don't know. Uh, okay. Now, um, let me point out why uh, these models may not be um, as complex as we think, or 
complexity at the, at the very least in the relative sense. So this is a summary of a bunch of models from 2022 and um, GPT-4 apparently has uh, about 2 trillion, but although so you can see they're all of the order of 100 to maybe 100 billion to a trillion parameters and similar number of training data, about a trillion tokens, a little under. Um, GPT-4 is slightly bigger, but maybe an order of magnitude at most, not much more than that. And uh, this is not confirmed, but uh, believed to be correct. Uh, and it's trained on about a trillion tokens. So you would think, okay, this is huge, right? It's a trillion parameters, trillion tokens. That seems huge. Well, um, there are reasons to think it's not as much as it seems. And one is that um, there was a paper a couple years ago. Uh, it was called Forecasting Transformative AI with Biological Anchors. And basically, the, if you make the parallel that the number of synapses in a um, uh, you, you know, animal brain is kind of analogous to the number of uh, parameters in the model, so synapses are connections between neurons. Um, then you can say, well, you need to, to model a human brain, you need about um, 10 to the 1400 trillion parameters, and then if you model the mm, progression of hardware, the prediction was that we will have human level intelligence by 2030. That was two years ago. This is, uh, oh, I don't have a year here. This is 2021, just two years ago. Now GPT-4 is actually a mouse brain by that model. It's just 10 to the 12 parameters. And it's already in many ways exceeds human abilities in most linguistics in most linguistic kind of problems. It certainly exceeds, if not every human, then at least uh, some sort of average ability. Like the, it has, l l let's say, the ability of, you know, maybe a strong undergraduate student in every, in every uh, area. So that, that's, um, that's kind of amazing. And it shows that this actually, um, Surprisingly few parameters are needed. Now, what, what about data? And again, we say, okay, 10 to the 20, 12 data points, that's a trillion data points, trillion words. That seems like a lot. But let's look at the state space of these models, right? The state space, if you have vocabulary size of uh, 10,000, which is actually an undercount because for um, these models, it's about 50,000 and you have context lengths of 4,000, then the state space is something of the order 10 to the 4 to the power of 4,000, right? And um, that is truly gigantic. That number is not comparable to anything. Um, now you can say, okay, but most of these uh, sentences are meaningless, right? Because it's just arbitrary collections of words. Say, okay, well, suppose you only have two possibilities for a meaningful sentence. Say, you, you know, you say, I go, I went. I went there, I came here, or something like that, right? You can just imagine that there are just two possibilities for continuation. Instead of 10 to the 4, you have 2 to the 4,000. That's still bigger than any sort of reasonable number. That's more than the number of atoms in the universe and so on. Um, so it's like a little bit like uh, reconstructing a library from a molecule of ink, right? This kind of task, it's like so absurdly. The amount of data compared to the size of the state space is so absurdly small. That it, it shouldn't be possible at all, like if there is any sort of course of dimensionality here or anything like that. So what is, this, what, what is the upshot? Is that the true complexity dimensionality of language must be actually very low in some sense, in an appropriate sense. This is not a high dimensional phenomenon. Um, well, what does it mean? It means that, um, more specifically, is that probably to predict the next uh, talking or the next, um, you know, word in a sensible way, there are just a few relevant directions that we need to consider. And I, I'll describe what it means more mathematically. Now, uh, let me sort of maybe take a step back and ask the following questions. Well, why, why can we predict anything at all? Okay, so let, let's look at a very simple, you, you know, kind of, you know, we can call it non-parametric regression or something. You have, you have a bunch of points on a line, right? And this is some sort of measurement. And I would like to, you know, draw some sort of curve which goes through those points. 
And so I would like to make predictions on points which are not part of my data, right? Those are points part of my data. Why is it possible? Like you would think like, well, in principle, I can take any curve that goes through these points. Uh, the dimensionality of such curves is infinite, of course, because it's all curves. So why is it that we can draw a curve like this and say that this is sensible? And actually the intuition for that comes from physics, right? The point is that we know that when we have measurements, most of the time, um, similar um, points which are close together in physical space probably will have similar measurements. This is not always true, but this is true most of the time. And once we believe this, if this is a reasonable uh, sort of inductive bias or re reasonable way to think about it, then we immediately have some sort of Lipschitz or Sobolev condition on the function. And once we say that this function needs to be Sobolev or Lipschitz, this is a much lower dimensional space, right? So we reduce dimensionality from, you know, being infinite to something with pretty low effective rank. Like if we bound, for example, a norm in some reasonable function space. Uh, so, in a sense, the physics of the problem, right, the physical fact that uh, proximity induces similar measurement actually forces us to have this uh, low dimensionality. Now, uh, we can do the same thing with more complicated things like convolutional filters, for example. Um, well, with convolutional filters, well, you can say that well, if we move our image a little bit left or right, right, the image doesn't change, but we're shifting it, so it needs to be translation invariant, and for that, something like a convolution would work. So again, this comes from physics, some sort of change of coordinate system, so you can incorporate some group action maybe into this. And the question now, what is the challenge? What is the physical law of language? Okay, so that's, um, I'm not unfortunately going to be able to answer this question. Uh, as much as I would like to. Uh, but um, I will sort of discuss some things which kind of maybe go in these directions, hopefully. So what type of low-dimensional structures do we need? And I think there are two things. And first, there is a dimension of the input, but there is also relevant dimensions. And I think I, I worked on manifold learning uh, for some time. And in manifold learning, we sort of think, okay, well, suppose our data is on a low-dimensional manifold. This is actually really helpful because we can derive a lot of uh, nice things from that. We can kind of avoid the curse of dimensionality. Um, it turns out this is good, but this is not enough. There is the other missing part, which I think, thanks to deep learning, is becoming clear now, is that we have to look at relevant dimensions. And I'll describe what it is. It's essentially... Uh, things related to multi-index models. Um, so that's the um, first question, what type of low-dimensional structures you need? And the second thing is like, what about neural networks? Why do neural networks do so well? And um, one thing is that uh, neural networks are very uh, complex objects, right? They have like all these parameters, they have hyperparameters. So just the number of hyperparameters is infinite. Right? Why? Well, because, for example, if you have learning rates, you have a schedule of learning rate that's potentially infinitely many parameters right there. So um, it's a gigantic space of possibilities. So we need to simplify this to have some sort of reasonable analysis. And one simplification is based on this idea, and this has been observed empirically, is that in general the number of model parameters actually helps. Like when you increase the size of the network, it usually helps. I mean, this is not a very specific thing because you obviously have to give more information than just this, but it has been observed that bigger networks work better in general. Okay, so why not just take infinitely many parameters? And um, it's actually, we kind of know that infinitely many parameters in many cases is okay. And, uh, y y you know, if we have some sort of risk curve and, uh, you know, something I worked on, um, if you increase the number of parameters, it often you observe that the risk empirically decreases with the number of parameters. So going to infinity in the number of parameters is certainly not an unreasonable thing and it sort of fits with what people have observed. 
And once you say this, well, you can immediately say, well, okay, but we actually know a lot about things with infinitely many parameters because these are basically Hilbert spaces. And in particular, you can say, well, this is a theory of reproducing Hilbert spaces, which goes back to the 50s of the last century and have been used in splines and kernel machines. And more recently, actually, very surprisingly, it was shown that under some conditions, wide neural networks are actually the same class of functions. So at least, in, I, I am making it clear that this is under specific conditions because we will see that it doesn't quite, it's not quite correct, it's not quite what we need. But at, at least at that time when this came out, uh, 2018, that was great because, you, you, you know, it was very exciting. They showed that infinitely neural networks are simply kernels. Kernels are something that we understand. Therefore, like, we can reconstruct everything that we know about neural networks in terms of kernels. It turned out to be a little more complicated. But uh, that was nice. And now, let me just very briefly re remind you what kernels are. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, maybe the easiest way to think about it, a kernel machine is just a function of this form. Uh, and it's a sum uh, of k of x i x when uh, k is, say, a Gaussian or Laplacian kernel. So, you know, you can just think of it as a function of this form. Okay? And alphas are chosen in the simplest case just to feed the data. So you fit your alphas so that uh, f of xi is equal to yi. And if you write this down, you see this is a matrix inversion with the matrix being the kernel matrix. Okay, so that's a really simple thing. It's, uh, you can think of it as linear regression or matrix inversion or whatever. Um, uh, the nice thing about this is that this actually comes from the infinite dimensional theory. It's a consequence of the representer theorem, but if you don't care, right, this is just an algorithm. Very simple. Uh, okay, so now uh, this seems to be good, right, because now we can show that infinitely wide neural networks are basically equivalent to radial kernel machine, and we are done. Um, and in fact, in some cases, you can see that this is even state of the art for certain problems. Uh, but turns out that the problem is actually much more complicated. And one, one thing is that, well, there is this persistent thing that it seems, okay, kernels are doing something, but neural networks do seem to be better, and they seem to be genuinely better. And let, let me give you a very simple experiment which kind of demonstrates that neural networks are really better. And the experiment is um, simply the following. You take x to just be a normally distributed variable, so it's a Gaussian in 100 dimensions. And uh, the target function here is x1 times x2, so it's a simple regression problem. There is no noise even, it's deterministic. So it's just a product of the first two variables, okay? So you have a 100 dimensional vector, your target is the first two variables. Uh, you know, one of the simplest thing you can imagine. And um, you, fit a kernel machine and you fit a neural network and what you observe is that r squared, so r, r squared, uh, remember, so r squared zero is bad and r squared one is good. So r squared is bad for radial kernel and it's really good for neural network, right? So a kernel basically fails almost completely and neural network just nails this problem, right? So after you see this, like clearly something is going on with neural networks, which is different. And surprisingly, this is observation is very new, and I think the first experiment of this type was like in 2018. Uh, and recently we have several works, a whole line of works which have been trying to understand like why neural networks can learn this type of problems. Uh, so now, let me uh, describe what neural networks, like why is neural network learning this problem and why is kernel failing? And I think neural network is doing the following. Uh, so if you think about, so suppose you have a trained neural network, so, so imagine that you have a, you train your neural network. And then the neural network, 
Um, just think of simple, fully connected neural network. So every input connected to everything in the first layer. Then there is a neural, you know, the, the weight matrix W1. And you can take W1 transpose W1. And W1 transpose to W1, you can think of it as a map from the input to itself. It's some sort of transformation of the input. And one way to think about what neural network does is to simply think of this as a filter. This thing some, is some sort of filter. It filters whatever it does. So it's not quite equivalent to a neural network itself, but you can think that you filter the input through, the, through this W1 transpose W, and then you apply the neural network after that. OK? Just, just sort of bear with me for a moment. So. Now, let's look at what this does when you, uh, when you actually do this on this problem. If you plot W transpose uh, W1, it's a 100 by 100 matrix. And what you see here is that the only two entries here, so this is kind of a blow up because 100 is a lot. Um, the only two non-zero entries here are the diagonal, uh, and, um, are the diagonal entries. So when you apply this as a filter, and everything which is black here is zero. It's not exactly zero, but it's close to zero. Um, so when you apply this matrix, you just filter out the first two coordinates. And um, this is amazing, because once you, if you learn, so the neural network somehow learns that the first two coordinates are the important ones. And once it does this, what you see is that if you actually know that these two coordinates are the only ones which are important, then 20 samples are enough, and you can do a kernel machine or you can do a neural network, it makes no difference. You get perfect reconstruction. So the key in the success of this neural network is the fact that it's doing this filtering. That's really the kind of the point here. And now, um, what does mathematically this filtering mean? And you can think of this filtering in terms of a different mathematical object. This object is uh, what you might call, um, well, it's called in the literature, average gradient. I'll just call it average gradient outer product. It's the same as expected gradient outer product. It depends what you mean by the expectation. And the thing is the following. So consider this function. Take its gradient, OK? Its gradient is simply because you're differentiating with x1 and x2 respectively, so you're getting x2 and x1. So it's just this matrix. Now, take the outer product of this. When you take outer product of this, you get the matrix, right? It's not the inner product, it's the outer product. And then you take expected value, and when you take the expected value, it just becomes 1, 1, and the rest of this is 0. So it's the same matrix as what we saw. It's a filter matrix. And the key observation here is that this matrix will filter out irrelevant coordinates. OK, so it does kind of the same thing as what neural network does. And this is not a new idea, by the way. It goes back at least like 20 plus years uh, in the statistics literature. There is also something called, uh, I think it's called effective dimensionality reduction. Uh, which is essentially the same type of idea. Um, so now, why is this a, a natural thing? And you can kind of think that, like, wh what does it do at every data point? So notice, oh, yeah, L let me make it very clear. This is gradient with respect to x, not with respect to w, right? The gradient is actually computed with respect to the input, not with respect to the parameters of the model. So this, for example, you can do it even if the model is black box, right? As long as you can compute gradients. And to compute gradients, you don't really need access to the internal part of the model, right? You can just add a little bit. You know, just add a little noise and compute the difference. Um, so why is this a natural thing? It's because when you look at the gradient, you say, well, OK, if my function only changes in this direction, I can ignore everything which happens in the perpendicular direction. So as long as this thing is low rank, I can ignore everything in the null space of this egg op. So that's basically what is happening here. And uh, therefore, this measures input directions which affect response for the model F. 
Now, uh, this leads to this, uh, what we call the deep neural feature ANTAT. And the ANTAT is simply the following. It says that, well, if you have a neural network and you train the neural network, then the W1 transpose W1 is proportional to this quantity to some power. Now, uh, the power, A, well, th there are some reasons to take this power one half in some cases, but uh, the more important thing is that the power is really not super important because what you care most is what the null set of the thing is, and the null set actually doesn't depend on the power. Okay? So, uh, okay. Now, uh, you can do the same thing for the deep for, for next layers, so, uh, but maybe I'll just skip this. And let, let me give you an empirical verification of this. So this is empirical verification is the correlation between a gop, that thing, and the actual W1, W1 transpose. Okay, and it does look like it's very strong for almost every architecture that we know of. So this is for transformers. This is uh, some other type of transformers. This vision transformers, the convolutional neural networks, and this uh, for uh, um, MLPs for fully connected. So you can see it's it's not, of course, hundred percent. That's why it's an answer. It's not exact. It's a, it's it's a conjecture, if you wish. Yeah. Uh, it's the output of the neural network. Yeah, thank you. This is, this is out because we don't know that. This, oh, yeah. I should point out, this are real data. And this are real neural network which are trained on this. Uh, and many of them are not trained by us. So. so we have no idea what the true regression function is. Um, I should point out another thing. I'm sweeping a little bit under the rug because the, the form of this answer is slightly different for this more complicated architectures. But I'm... Um, because uh, you have to kind of pass it through the filter. But, uh, um, but mm, yeah, I, 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 maybe I'll say something about that later. But you, you can see, like, for example, for, um, for all of these architectures, the correlation is very strong. It's like uh, at least 0.8. In, in some cases, it's like 0.95. So it's very, very strongly correlated, but it's not quite the same thing. It's not exact. Uh, it's a correlation between this AGOP matrix and WW transpose. So we have two matrices, and we just compute. We'll just treat them as vectors, compute correlation. So we would like to prove that they're proportional, right? So we measure that correlation. Uh, so this is, a, I think, a kind of nice example of how features appear when you train the neural network. And um, so this is just W1, W transpose, and you can look at the bottom line, which corresponds to the green curve. And the, the problem here, there are a bunch of images, and the question is, well, do they have glasses? And what you can see is that it starts with something which has just random noise, white noise. So that's an initialization, right? You initialize as networks at random. And then as you train this, you basically get something which looks like glasses, which is exactly what you would expect. So it selects relevant features. If you want to detect whether people have glasses, well, you better look at the area where glasses usually are, right, around the eyes. Uh, OK. So I think, sort of, I hope I convinced you that neural networks can learn relevant features. but. That's maybe not the most interesting part of this. Well, that is interesting on its own, but, um, but what is perhaps more important is that what is, like, why, can, why, is neuro, why are neural networks special? Like, what is special about neural networks? And actually, once you start looking at kernel, it becomes kind of obvious. Like, imagine I have some function of this form. Now, remember, I have my... my xi is a hundred dimensional vector, but only the first two coordinates are important, right? The rest of them are junk. So how is distance computed here? Well, distance is computed against all coordinates, including those which are junk, right? So the coordinates which are junk are going to overwhelm the coordinates which are actually informative. 
So important directions are just simply swamped by these features which are completely irrelevant. And this distance have very little information. So even if it's on a low dimensional manifold, that's not quite enough. Like in that example that I have, the, my Gaussian is not low dimensional, it's a 100 dimensional Gaussian. But the number of relevant coordinates is just two. So if you think about it, it's some sort of dual problem, right? You have the input and you have the output. The input dimensionality is 100, so it's not really low dimensional. But the output dimensionality is somehow two. And that's really nice because we, so we should be able to exploit dimensionality or whatever is smaller, the input or the output. And in manifold learning, we have only looked at uh, input. Uh, okay, that being um, an aside. Now, okay, now actually we have a nice way to think about neural networks. What's a neural network? A neural network is something actually quite simple. Uh, you can think that neural network is a kernel machine plus some sort of feature learning object. And this feature learning object is simply some sort of projection some low rank matrix. So the goal now is not just to learn um, a predictor, you want to learn a pair, a low dimensional, uh, low rank matrix A, and the predictor F. Now, okay, this is a little bit less of a nice problem, right, because if we have a kernel machine, this is a convex optimization problem, this is not convex anymore. Uh, but that's okay, we sort of, made peace with that uh, in recent years where, okay, with non-convexity, many things are non-convex and they still work. Uh, so maybe it's okay, not a big deal. Uh, okay, so what does it suggest? It actually suggests the following algorithm. And this is what we call recursive feature machine. And the algorithm is very simple. So you get your data, you start with some kernel, and actually, kernel you never change. You, you don't have to. You don't even have to have a kernel. You can have any predictor here. This is really not important. That the form of predictor is not important here. But let's just think about the kernel. Um, and what you do, you train this kernel, or tra train whatever the predictor you have here. You compute its egop or agop by simply computing the gradient. Here, notice that the only thing I need to assume is that I need to be able to compute this, right, the, the, this gradient, which for most things you can. And then you simply rescale data and you plug the data back here and then you repeat. So that's the iteration. Now, yeah, any questions about this? I mean, that's a kind of central object maybe of the of the, well, there are kind of two central concepts, this and the ansatz itself. Yeah, questions? Um, well, we're still doing something continuous here, right? Because, yeah, so the, the even, even, like, actually, we use it for classification all the time. So even though the labels are zero, one, we, we have some sort of linear combination of continuous things. Now, why does it apply to zero, one? Well, it seems to work, right? You, you may say, okay, doesn't it jump? I guess smoothing is, is kind of okay. Yeah? Yeah, I'm good. Um, so in some cases, actually, let me postpone this. I have some, I, I have some, there is some reason to choose different. So for the ansatz, we actually initially we had m alpha equals one, but then it turns out that alpha equals one half, both more accurate and also better motivated because we, we can show that in some cases it has to be half. It's somehow how much you weigh the important features and how much you want to kill off the unimportant features. So if the matrix is truly projection, so for projection matrix, it makes no difference, right? But because it's not exactly a projection, it actually is, uh, is significant. Any other question? It's, yeah, it's positive. Uh, it's positive number. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry, I switched the notation. A is M. Or M to the alpha, rather. Yeah. Uh, M represents A. Yeah? 
Go. Next slide. When you were cursing, actually, now it feels more like a lot of just small people. Because then a lot of things change. The linear transformation is basically. Yeah. It's somehow a little bit like multi-layer. Um, there's some sort of recursion, right? You can kind of you, you can unfold the recursion and make it multi-layer, right? I, I don't know if I think this thinking of this as one layer is exactly right. Thinking of this as multi-layer, I, I don't know. Maybe I mean it's equivalent, I suppose. But I, I'm not. I don't know if it helps. Maybe it does. I don't know. Um, in some cases, yes. Um, oh, okay, there, there are two questions there. Actually, can, can I postpone this? Because uh, th there are two questions that you're asking. Uh, well, fold, fold it into one. And I think I'll address them. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, so uh, I'll just go through. If you if you have Laplace kernel in particular, you have this nice closed form. Everything is very nice. You you, you just plug this in. Actually, you can get GPT-4 to implement this, although it's not practical. It's, it doesn't give you good code, but it will work. Um, okay. Now, okay, once you have this, let me just show you some results and then I kind of maybe go back to some of these questions. Um, uh, now, same problem. You do Laplace kernel, you get terrible result. With NTK, you get slightly better results, still terrible. Deep network does very well and uh, RFM does basically exactly the same. And you can look at this matrix that you produce, and it's exactly the same as W under. Well, visually the same. It's not I shouldn't say exactly the same. It's visually identical. Uh, so that's good. Now you can actually look at um, this is an average of 180 data sets of uh, all of UCI uh, data sets, uh, and RFM is actually by significant margin the best among, uh, I think, 179 methods. Um, furthermore, actually, neural network is not that great on this data set. Neural network is much slower to run as well. This is very fast. Now, uh, let me make a couple of points here. Why neural network, how neural networks differ from RFM. And here is the interesting thing, is that neural network does two things at the same time. It optimizes feed to data, and at the same time, it also finds these features, right? And both of these are controlled by the same parameter, which is like learning rate, or whatever hyperparameters you have. So you have two processes controlled by the same parameter. That's why in neural network you have all these parameters, which are very, you need to choose very carefully. You have initialization, you have learning rate schedule, you have exactly like how you do optimization and so on. Depending on how you choose those, you either get good feature learning or you don't. These things are coupled. So if, for example, your optimization process is too fast, you get zero, and before any features can be selected, and that's kind of the NTK, what's called the NTK regime, neural tangent kernel regime. If it's too slow, then you just don't get convergence, right? So you need not too fast, not too slow, this kind of Goldilocks. Um, furthermore, the evaluation, the difference between evaluation loss and training loss is very important because it's a training loss which gives you feature learning. So to say that the training loss is a proxy for an evaluation is fundamentally incorrect because it has this completely different role in neural networks, which is feature learning. Uh, now, for RFM, the loss is identically zero at every step. At least that's the way I posed it. So you don't have any gradient, like you, you don't have any gradient with respect to the parameters. That's just zero. And feature learning is decoupled from loss minimization. It's a completely different algorithm. Uh, I mean, you, you have the separate step. It's a lot like EM somehow. And maybe I'll skip because I'm running out of time. Let me point out a couple of things which are quite interesting for sparse recovery. So um, if you have, so this is a very 
simple model. So imagine that I have X transpose times W, uh, this dot means just pointwise product. So you can think of it as a simple neural network, it's a two-layer kernel, linear kernel, right? And actually, if you apply RFM to this, you get a quite an interesting algorithm. You, the algorithm uh, is the following. You basically minimize the norm subject to this constraint. So you, you, it's essentially some sort of um, pseudo inverse. So you take an inverse here, solve a linear regression, and then you do the update of the weights, these MTs, and um, to some power, and then you go back. And, oh, this is, by the way, um, this is not yet online, but we're going to put it on the archive. Uh, this is with Dima uh, Drusvatsky. Uh, and um, this algorithm is quite interesting because uh, it turns out that this is something which is, uh, in a, uh, so that, that form is actually a generalization of um, IRLS, which is it, um, iteratively related least squares algorithm. So RFM is actually a generalization of IRLS, and for, interestingly enough, it has the same, um, I don't, you cannot say that it's generalization of deep, deep linear neural networks, but you, what you can show is that the fixed points are the same. And um, so depth in this case is not, it's completely absorbed in this parameter, at least for the linear case. So that's a partial answer to that question. Um, now, uh, the interesting thing is that the losses that they implement is quite interesting. So RFM, depending on how you choose as parameters, you have, um, so, so you know, in linear sparse regression, right, you use L1 loss, and L1 loss is simply this. But if you um, use these different parameters, you get quite interesting loss. And like this loss, for example, um, uh, uh, sorry, it's not a loss, it's a norm. Um, and the norm that you're minimizing is actually, it's not really a norm, it's like one over x, it's singular. And the thing is, you're not, oh, I, I'm sorry, when you have something like this, you need to, well, you minimize minus or you maximize one over x. So it's not really a norm, it's something similar to a norm, but um, it works like a norm. But the interesting thing is that this seems to work best, actually, this weird norms, not, not L1, for, for the noisy case, at least. And the same thing is true for uh, sparse matrix reconstruction. It's almost exactly the same thing. Uh, you can use it for sparse matrix reconstruction, and it turns out that uh, it actually works exceptionally well. It's better than neural networks, like three-layer neural networks. It's better than uh, three-layer neural networks, I think, previously was state-of-the-art, but this is better. Um, so this, this is, in fact, connects to this classical uh, reweighted least squares algorithms which are used to minimize this norm. So for example, you can see nuclear norm. Actually, this is quite interesting. So this is the number of observed entry in a matrix. The matrix, has a, it's a low rank matrix, it's a rank 10. And you're basically trying to reconstruct the matrix from this observed entries. And uh, what you see is that the nuclear norm and depth to neural network are actually almost the same. The nuclear norm is uh, some sort of very standard optimization method for that. Uh, depth three neural network initially works worse, but then it outperformed them significantly. So if you run it a little more, it will actually merge with this. So that's basically the connection. And the depth here of a neural network, so depth four doesn't really help. So depth three is already the best in this case, at least. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. Depth three is significantly better than depth two, uh, but depth four doesn't do anything. But you can kind of see because there's a depth here corresponds to this choice of parameter. And it seems that in our experiment, this one half is best. We don't, we don't have a proof that this is best, but it seems to be. Um, now, um, let me actually say in one more point about depth. So from a practical point of view, if you want to replace, at least for fully connected neural networks, we don't see any improvement from depth, just empirically, on like standard problems like UCI data sets, that kind of thing. So one layer is enough. Um, for convolutional, it's different. It seems that you have to do several layers. 
Okay, I'm running out of time, so maybe I have too many slides, but um, you can play the same game for images, and you can kind of see what this um, AGOP matrix tells you. It's, it works as some sort of filter on images, and it can actually show you what aspects of this image the network is paying attention somehow on average. So it's kind of nice, for example, for like a dog, you can see that the eyes come out after like some number of layers. So this is like you're you treating the input to that layer as your function and you're computing derivative of the neural network with respect to that input. And uh, I skip this. Maybe I'll, I'll skip most of this. But uh, le let me maybe do the last one. And th this is quite interesting. Uh, so you can do, play the same game with transformers and um, so you take this matrix, right? And uh, if you think about what this matrix tells you, this matrix is some sort of low rank projection, right? So what you'd expect is that the eigenvectors of this matrix with large coefficients, large eigenvalues, are the important features. And that's indeed is the case. So you can think of feature extraction as just looking at eigenvectors of that matrix. And in particular, if you look at uh, in a transformer, if you, do, if, um, if you look at what the eigenvectors correspond to, you can project your tokens onto the directions of the eigenvectors in this kind of internal representation. And you see that these are actually very, very nice clusters. You get things like dinner and soup and pizza and sandwich and dish and so on. So it's like food and, you know, uh, adjectives and, you know, uh, verbs and so on. So clearly, the transformer, when you train it, and you just look at the eigenvectors, you're already getting a lot of information just out of the eigenvectors. So this is very similar, in a sense, to something, you, you know, like, to, to things like eigenfaces, which were done, like, a long time ago. But this is getting, somehow, it from internal structure of the network itself. And in fact, you can even take, like, some text, and you can highlight like how much these points, these tokens, align with uh, one of these eigenvectors. And you can see that the green ones basically are names and um, animals. This is trained on tiny stories, which are kind of baby stories. Uh, so this is why I'm saying this is, I, I think this is quite hopeful, that we can extract semantic information. Clearly, this is much simpler than what we want. But we already like, can get something which is non-trivial, at least, from just thinking about it this way. Uh, OK, I'll, maybe I'll just have a few concluding thoughts. I, I think we, what we have seen is that immense resources concentrated on a narrow class of models, an extremely impressive result, but no reason to think this are optimal models. And you, you know, ultimately, they're fairly simple statistical models. That's what they are. Uh, we should be able to understand this. If we want to control, understand the output, or to do any sort of safety, you know, alignment or whatnot, again, I think we have to understand how they work. Otherwise, uh, I mean, how can we deal with something which is so complex? It has this kind of human, superhuman complexity, in a sense. Like, we have to understand. Um, I think the theory that we need is sort of physics style, like we don't have to prove everything, but we have to understand the, 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 the basic, uh, um, the, the basic setup, and um, I think be, beware of overanalyzing existing architectures. And um, um, okay, uh, I think uh, finally, I think it's um, I, I think this is hopeful, and it connects. Like even for the linear case, which is a particularly simple case, it connects to a lot of um, literature that has been you, you, you know worked on pretty in detail for sparse inference, for example. So, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll leave you with this. All right, thank you, Misha, for the uh, definitely thought-provoking talk. Um, I've been told that we should use the mic for questions because we have people online listening, so. Oh, very nice. So if you use the deep learning to come up with your M, so you kind of you combine them, 
You don't use your kernel as the first one to come up with the M. You run a separate deep learning and use that for your M. Will that get better results? Uh, which M? Well, it's your derivative, uh, the, the outer product of the... Uh, I, I mean, M is very simple, right? It's just a derivative. Which yeah, but you're using the, de the kernel to get your uh, M. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can do the same thing from a network. It's so, so oh, okay, and I, I didn't really explain what's happening here. This is extracted from the neural network. This is M from neural network. So you are using the We take the a VGG, right, which is one of the standard. So you are using, not using the kernel. If you use the kernel, it wouldn't work. Uh, we can get something similar, but actually, it's, in this case, it's better to use the network itself. How so much better? Um, it depends on the... So we can beat standard... So. We can beat a kind of plain neural network, a vanilla one, uh, convolutional. But um, to beat something like VGG, we would need to use this compositional kernels, and they're very expensive to compute. So it seems like it's more of a computational issue than uh, I fundamental. See. We basically just cannot compute it. Hey, thank you for a, a wonderful talk. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to how your method would work where which, in cases where which variable is relevant depends on the location in the feature space. In particular, you take this expectation over everything. So for example, if you're trying to fit the softmax function, where the variable that matters is the one that happens to be largest, but in expectation, all of them are equally important. That's a great question. So I think it will help. We don't do it. Um, there are a couple of reasons we don't do it. Well, one reason, if you take something like... Um, an MLP, it also doesn't do it. So to beat an MLP, you really don't need to do that. Um, the reason we don't do it is actually not because it's not a good idea, but because it just it makes it more complex. So, so I, I think the next thing is you, you do want to have it locally. You, you, you do want to do it locally to, to somehow have some sort of local fitting of this M's. But, uh, but that's like a, a whole, like another layer of complexity there. Hello. Um, at least for the tabular data, do you, do you have a sense of how sensitive the iterative algorithm is to the choice of kernel and how many iterations do you usually run it for? Uh, yeah, for tabular data, um, we choose, La so we actually, Laplace kernel seems to be very robust and most of the time we use robust, uh, we just use Laplace. Sometimes NTK seems a little better, but the differences are not huge usually. Uh, I would recommend just using Laplace just because it seems very nice. It's like very easy. Gaussian gets similar results, but it's much more sensitive. Uh, and the number of iteration is small. Like for tabular data, it's like three. So you solve three, you essentially solve three linear regressions. Any other questions? Thanks. Uh, Misha, my question is similar to the last question. So you need to, in your method, you need to recursively solve a kernel regression. So, uh, so uh, are you inverse the uh, kernel matrix? And uh, will that be a problem if you want to apply that method in larger scale? Uh, will you have a larger scale data set to deal with? Uh, not really. We have uh, we have more effective. So I think in a lot of this we simply just do inversion, just because it's like easier. But uh, we, we have um, we, we have effective, we have pretty efficient algorithm for large kernel solvers. Like uh, we, we have something called EigenPro, which basically you, you can do a few million data points pretty easily. For a trillion, I don't know. We haven't never tried it. That I, I think we can scale it to about hundred million. We, we have we have scaled it to about hundred million data points. Um, beyond that, uh, I think we still can, but we need massive computational resources. But it, I don't think it's not a fundamental problem. It's a problem. We know how to do it. Uh, it's a problem of getting the pipelines correctly and so on, and, and having the correct compute. So, so if we com compare the compute required for your method versus the compute required for your network, would you, which, which one would you say it's more compute efficient? At least for small data, it's way faster. It's like 40 minutes versus five hours. But uh, part of it is not because of compute itself. It's just because for neural network, you have to try many more parameters. 
So for small data, it's more, I would say it's clearly more compute efficient. For large data, we just don't have, like I don't even know how, what I would do with like 100 billion data points. Like there is no sort of, it may be a small number, but it's kind of big for me. Any other questions? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, one question. Suppose uh, ultimately if you can build the model like really works and also uh, build with kernels like this recursive kernel machines. Uh, what's your thoughts on like uh, solving the alignment and safety problem you, you, you talked about uh, at the end? Yeah, yeah. I, I think, okay, there is no guarantee we can solve them even if we can do this. But my, my claim is kind of the... Uh, what do you call it, the reverse, subverse, whatever. Uh, is that if we, don't sol if we don't solve this, we cannot solve those. And uh, so how, how can something like that work, right? So imagine we can build an LLM. We don't even necessarily have to have a kernel machine. We just need to find all this low dimensional representation. So you imagine I have something like this. Sorry, taking too many slides. <laughs> Like, this is pretty good already. Like, imagine OpenAI gives me, like, their training data set. Well, okay, if they give me their training data set, I know, don't know what to do with it. But they, they, they can do it themselves. Um, and whenever you put a query, you get some sort of represent, internal representation of that thing. And then you get this low dimensional kind of projection. And this could be, like, references to which document in the data set is most aligned with what it's saying from the query, right? So you can look at the alignment, you know, not in that sense, but in the alignment between the document in the training set and the query, and then at least you know what it's drawing on, right? Maybe it's telling you to build a bomb or something, right? It's like, okay, like I don't want that. So you, you, I don't think neural network itself is enough. You need a model plus a training set. And I think if you have a combination of the two, you can at least know what it's drawing on. So that's, and now, is this enough to solve this alignment problems and so on? Who knows? I don't know. But it is something. It's more than we have now. I think that's a good place to end. Let's give Misha a big round of applause once again. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.